Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Realm of Unknown podcast, the podcast where we talk about all sorts of bizarre, spooky, and paranormal things out there in the world. And today we have a rather strange topic of the week, uh, a cryptid, uh, that being said, one that isn't super well known, but whose name is fairly common if you are sort of into this general field. Um, and one whose overall story sh- seems to shift upon who kind of learns about it and evolves over time. So that's a little bit of a preview for what to expect. Um, as for the general podcast updates and stuff to sort of chit chat, I guess, about, um, there really isn't too much aside from the Patreon getting uh, the new sort of bonus series, which had been previewed previously in previous episodes. I said that preview a lot. But it is the SEPTA series, which if you guys are not familiar with or had not heard about it, it is the actually previous episode that was aired here on the podcast as a sort of preview sort of trailer version of what to expect later on into the series. Moving forwards, other episodes will be Patreon exclusive. So if you did enjoy it, uh, it's sort of a collection of just bizarre or interesting stories and encounters that I've had on public transportation here in Philly. So aside from that, there's not really too many updates. And like I mentioned in the opening, we had a bit of a preview as to, I'm saying preview way too much, a sort of overview of what we can be expecting for this episode. And it kind of has a special place in my heart. What It was one of the first topics to really get a sort of a hit, in a sense, over on YouTube when I was doing that back, I believe this was uploaded in 2015. It was like a really, really early one that I did. Uh, and this is all the more bizarre because uh, my original script for that video uh, it was literally like two very short paragraphs, and I somehow made that into like a two minute long video, and it is really bad. Like it's really bad. Um, I have improved since. I I hope. Um, it's been six years, so I really do hope I have improved. Uh, but don't worry, we are going to be talking um a bit more about the general overview of it and to unveil what we are going to be discussing. We are talking about the myths and the legends surrounding the Mongolian death worm. So the Mongolian death worm is a creature who is alleged to exist in the Gobi Desert, which if you're unfamiliar of, you know, the general geography of the world, the Gobi Desert is a sort of dry desert-like region in Eastern Asia, and it's occupying you know, sections of northern China and a lot of southern Mongolia. Uh, Hence the name, the Mongolian death worm. Uh, Fun fact, in Mongolian, their name for the worm actually translates to the large intestine worm. It's gross, it's kind of neat, and it also kind of relates to how the worm is described. So according to sightings of the worm, the Mongolian death worm is a long, sausage-like sandworm. It is dark red uh, in color with spikes jetting out of both ends of its shapeless body. The worm uh, is also known to have venomous spit that is so strong that it can actually corrode metal. And there are some recent, or I should say more recent reports in the general timeline of things, that actually gives the worm the ability to produce electrical shocks, which are powerful enough to kill an adult man. I, I don't know how they explain it fully. We will talk about it, but there's nothing that really explains why the electrical shocks were added into the mix. So these deadly creatures are said to live just below the sands of the Gobi Desert and are feared pretty much throughout the region. That being said, though, no one actually has come forward, I should say, with proof of seeing them firsthand. For the most part, if you go to the region and you discuss the stories of, you know, the death worm, you hear uh, retellings, a lot of them are rumors. 
And a lot of them are kind of passed down and sort of whispered down the lane. For the most part, it's very much an urban legend of the region, and most people have stories of other people. It's it's kind of bizarre, it's kind of strange, um, and it's sort of unique in a lot of ways. Uh, so today, I'm going to be doing my best to sort of break down and describe the origins of the death worm, some of the stories, and uh, how people have kind of interacted with it throughout the years. With the caveat... Um, that most of this is being described through the eyes of how the worm was unveiled, in a sense, to the Western world. Um, obviously, stories and legends have been associated with the region for decades and centuries ahead of time, uh, with you know native tribes, indigenous people to the region of Mongolia and the Gobi Desert. So. And like, you know, nomadic peoples of that region. So in no way, shape or form am I saying that this is the entirety of the information out there. But a lot of that early information is kind of kept in books and stories and sort of verbal retellings that are exclusive to that area, uh, if that makes sense. So it's kind of hard to kind of compile all of that stuff. And as you'll see, most of the, again, it's like sort of an urban legend. So a lot of the reports are kind of general. So most stuff you'll see online kind of start at this point anyways. Uh, so again, though, it's just a caveat to say that, hey, there is much more of a rich history ahead of what we're going to be talking about, but it's exclusive to the indigenous people there. This is very much, you know, the idea that like, hey, Europeans never heard of this and it never existed until they did. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, that being said, though, it, it is kind of interesting to see the evolution of how this kind of evolves as if people are rediscovering this for the first time. It's kind of neat. I kind of like that, um, especially when we're going to be talking about the potential explanation for this. I think it kind of plays into it nicely. Okay, so first off, most of the early sightings and most of the early accounts are coming from uh, literature. Uh, specifically, the creature first drew Western attention as a result of the American paleontologist Roy Chapman Andrews God, in his 1926 book titled On the Trail of Ancient Man. In this book, Andrews describes secondhand tales of the monster that he had heard at a gathering of Mongolian tribal officials. Now, this kind of group sort of entitled a lot of uh, very influential political and local government figures at the time. Uh, he is quoted in the book as saying, None of those present had ever seen the creature but they all firmly believe in its existence and described it minutely. I don't really know what minutely says, uh, but he will be explaining it in a moment. Furthermore, in the book, Andrew cites a description of the creature from Mongolian Prime Minister uh, Damdin Dazar, who in 1922 gave the following information. It is shaped like a sausage about two feet long, has no head nor leg, and it is so poisonous that merely the touch uh, means instant death. It lives in the most desolate parts of the Gobi Desert. So, 10 years after this original book in 1932, Andrews actually followed up this information by publishing a second book and retouching on the death worm. Uh, this book was actually titled The New Conquest of Central Asia, which is not loving the title, but the details of the death worm uh, is, you know, elaborated on with this new installment. Um, essentially, it sort of uh, details that the worm is commonly cited and reported to live in the most arid, sandy regions of western of the western Gobi Desert. However, further research into the legends expanded that sort of habitat that the worm has into more of the western slash southern regions of the desert. 
However, Andrews, despite all his research, despite all the communications with the locals and stories and investigations, ultimately does not believe that the creature exists. So we got all that work, all those books, and just he doesn't really think it's there, uh, which is a trend that you'll slowly will un- will unravel. So this next sort of section is a lot of investigations um books are kind of mentioned but for the most part these are people actively looking for the worm uh, or doing research into it so a no- another notable figure relating to the death worm outside of traditional native culture of course is one ivan mackerel who is a czech uh cryptozoologist and engineer so between the late 1980s and the early 1920s that's not right. <laughs> I, I completely did that wrong. Between the late 1980s and the early 1990s, Mackerel had led uh, several small groups of companions into the Gobi Desert in order to search for the worm. So during some of these expeditions, Mackerel conducted a sort of, or he constructed a like motor-driven thumper, which if you're familiar with the movie slash novel Dune, it's kind of similar to that. They they use it for like, I don't know, cycling through the sand for searching for stuff. It's weird. But he was inspired based off of that. Uh, he also used small explosions to try to find it and literally was just blowing up sand in the desert. Uh, so, cool. Uh, so, the first of these trips into Mongolia, Mackerel had in 1990... His team began uh, an eight-week search and expedition for the large, lethal, worm-like creature. And Ivan believed that it resembles an, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, and we're going to talk about it later, an Afubini. So, uh, yeah, it's a term, it's a, what's the actual term? It's family, I guess, of animals, uh, primarily in South America, but they kind of, or at least the one that he's talking about. Um, but they stretch all over the world, and we will talk about them in a moment, uh, in more detail. Uh, but just keep that in mind. So Macro describes the animal from his own secondhand uh, reports as the following. Sausage-like worm over half a meter, uh, 20 inches, long and thick as a man's arm. Resembling the intestines of a cattle, its tail is short, and if it were cut off, Uh, does not taper. It is difficult to tell its head from its tail because it has no visible eyes, nostrils, or mouth. Its color is dark red like blood or salami. So he surmises that the worm extracts its venom uh, from the Goya plant. And he, uh, Ivan is actually the one who associates the trait of the worm being able to deliver lethal electrical shocks. And again, I don't know where he got this from. I'm assuming it's from reports, but again, like I, I do not know where he got this from. So, okay, two years later, uh, in 1992, Mackerel made his second eight-week trip into Mongolia during which he uh, was warned by a Buddha or Buddhist monastery that the worm was a creature of, quote, supernatural evil and that he was endangering his life while searching for the creature. And uh, Mackerel recalls having a rather vivid vivid dream of the worm during this particular expedition uh, and states that he woke up with unexplained blood-filled boils on his back. Uh, he did collect photographs and footage and data uh, during this particular expedition, uh, so much so that he made a documentary of his trip to Mongolia uh, called The Sand Monster Mystery, and it was broadcasted on Czech television in 1993. And before you ask, I cannot find it online, like anywhere. I don't know where it is. Uh, if anyone is from the Czech Republic or from that area of the world and happened to have recorded this back in 1993, let me know. I don't think we have any listeners in the Czech Republic. If we do, I'm sorry, but it's a small number. Okay, so 
the third expedition that he took. This one, we jump about nine years into 2004, and uh, Mackerel launches his third expedition into Mongolia in the late summer of that year. He scored the desert with uh, ultralight pilot Yuri Zetka, uh, and they had a video camera attached to the aircraft, but again, even that led to pretty much nothing for the expedition. However, despite not being able to capture any physical evidence, Mackerel ultimately concluded, very similar to Andrews, that uh, the worm is likely that of a mythical origin. And when I say mythical, that is his exact words, but it's not in the paranormal sense, but rather a figment of imagination or an illusion, uh, uh, essentially. And he concludes that this may have been brought about by the extreme heat and conditions of the desert. So, a year later in 2005, this is another person at this point. A year later in 2005, a zoologist journalist or zoological journalist, Richard Freeman of the Century of Fortune Zoology, mounted an expedition to hunt for the death worm, but came up empty handed again. Freeman also came to the conclusion, similar to the other ones, that the Tales of the Worm's power is simply apocryphal, in a sense. He supposes that, um, again, similar to Mackerel, that the sightings could likely be involved with an unknown species of Aphibene. Again, I'm probably going to pronounce that wrong, and I will be changing the name later. Uh, next, in 2006 to 2007, the Destination Truth, gotta love you, uh, Josh Gates, was hosting their own expedition into the desert, and that sort of entire adventure, uh, was premiered in the season two, season, or episode two, episode, oh my gosh, I can't pronounce anything. That expedition was aired in episode two of season two, uh, you know, surrounding the search for the death worm. So, okay, uh, two years later, in August of 2009, a New Zealand television entertainment reporter, David Ferry of TV3 News, took part in an expedition, but again, came up empty-handed. Uh, he concluded in interviews with locals claiming to have seen the worm, uh, and he mentioned on his website that the sightings actually peaked around the 1950s. I'm not 100% sure as to why that's the case. Um, I don't know anything too notable as to why people would spot that. Obviously, the world was kind of in a state of repair slash tensions that might have to play into that. I don't know. Um, I don't really know the geopolitical landscape of Mongolia back in the 1950s. Uh, I apologize. So, uh, for this last little section that we want to talk about, uh, we have a sense of explanation to what people might be seeing, uh, particularly animal explanations. So, interestingly enough, we're going to take a few steps back, and uh, back in 1980, 83, so before any of these expeditions, a specimen of tartar sand boa, which is a snake that is rather sparingly spotted in Mongolia, was shown to locals and they claimed, or I should say, shown to locals who had claimed to have seen the death worm previously. Upon witnessing the serpent, they actually confirmed that this was the animal that they had witnessed. So, Obviously, that's not an explanation for everyone's sightings, um, because obviously, but it does kind of lay the groundwork for the idea that people are simply misidentifying something out in the desert, obviously mixed with poor visibility, heat, all that stuff. Um, but this is kind of the stepping point. And as our final note, um, and a very similar note, relating to the M. <laughs> This is probably the last time I'll, I'll say it. Amphibus, Amphibini, um, that we mentioned earlier. Uh, these things are 
wild. They're also known as worm lizards, and they look nearly identical to snakes. Like, you could be mistaken to think that they're snakes. Um, They have, like, lizard-like heads, and apparently, like, one of the distinguishing aspects of them is the fact that their right lung is bigger than their left lung. Because I guess snakes have one lung that's bigger so that it could like fit in their skinny body. It's really weird. They're very creepy, but they're kind of cool. Um, that being said, they could be a possible and rather strong culprit, I would say, for the death worm sightings. So the worm lizards almost resemble kind of primitive snakes, having no limbs and commonly having ring-like scale placements along their bodies. Now, there are some members of the family that have legs, but they're kind of like separate. Uh, But for the most part, the group that we're talking about within the family, the worm lizards, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, For any of you zoologists out there who are screaming and throwing a fit. So, okay. Furthermore, uh, burrowing is pretty common and uh, it's a pretty common form of travel and living for this general group of animals. Uh, which, again, ties into the death worm that is believed to be the method in which it gets around. There are nearly 200 species of these guys, and while the colors do vary across the various species, there are several that are a shade of red and brown, which are close to the death worm. They are also pretty similar uh, from either end, So head to tail, which again is a description that the death worm has in most of its sightings in which people report that it's difficult to discern which end it has. Now, the worm lizards do have obviously mouths, nostrils, eyes, but if you're looking from above, like you would never see that. It it looks like a giant worm, really. It's very bizarre. Now, there are aspects that go against this family of reptiles being the culprit first is their their the supposed range of inhabitants um so despite there being 200 species pretty much the worm lizards can be found within north central south america europe asia and or europe africa and western asia as well as the caribbean so Within Western Asia, it's mainly within the Middle East. They don't really get much further than Saudi Arabia and, like, parts of Iraq and Iran. They're not found further east than the Caspian Sea, which Mongolia is further east and north. So it has that going against it. But again, we are leaning into the idea that this might be in undiscovered species so who knows and it is you know the gobi desert so yeah uh okay second most species are less than six inches long which is definitely below the two foot death worm size description the only caveat here which is like a deviation of a deviation is that there are species that do tend to be a bit larger the largest of these species animals being the I thought I was not going to pronounce this again the amph the amphibony alba which is from South America which if you remember is what mackerel was talking about these ones actually tend to grow between 15 and uh, 33 inches or 400 to 850 millimeters which is pretty snug inside the two foot range of the death worm. So I would say it's possible uh, for an animal like this. So if the death or if the worm lizards are to blame for the death worm sightings, then it again, more than likely has to be an undiscovered or long lost species of this animal, uh, which again is possible. It's out in the desert. A lot of the people who live there are, you know, nomadic tribes that are reporting this or, people who are passing down stories and don't have firsthand accounts. So who knows? Like, honestly, who knows? So as a final note, before we kind of close this out, I will be sharing on social medias and on Patreon, a photo 
of the amphibimese uh supposed or I should say messed up skeleton. Um so I'll be sharing a photo and I swear to god guys the these creatures if they're not an uh an inspiration for the xenomorphs and aliens I don't know what is their skeleton looks almost identical to the little mouth tongues that pop out it is crazy um uh, so yeah that's my final point and that is the mongolian death worm i i hope you guys enjoyed again this was a topic that i did do back on youtube years and years and years ago and it was kind of nice going back to it and touching it up you know applying the more uh matured sense of research that i have now uh compared to back then when i would literally just write down two literally two paragraphs and read it and be like oh yeah cool no wonder youtube didn't work out so i hope you guys did enjoy uh if you did it really would mean a lot uh if you guys would take the time and consider leaving a review you could do so over on apple Podcasts, stitcher and now spotify which they're adding which is great which is technically my main platform because i I do this through Anchor, and Anchor is bought by Spotify, so technically I'm a Spotifyer. So if you guys could leave a review, that'd be amazing. Uh, and if you are interested in having some extra little bonus content, some extra series, and some behind the scenes content, polls, all sorts of goodies, uh, you could do so by checking out the Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash realm of unknown where we have a one, three, and five dollar tier list, and you get more goodies as you move up. Uh, again, if you want to check that out, feel free to. We're going to have some extra, you know, behind the scenes uh, bonus stuff from this episode posted up there. Uh, so we definitely give it a, a check. Um, and you know, there's going to be a extra bonus episode that we upload every week after the main feed, which is also going up there uh, after this episode goes live. Uh, so aside from that, uh, check out these social medias, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever. We're pretty much everywhere. Uh, Realm of Unknown. And we are we are starting TikTok. <laughs> um, I, I had said that for the longest time, and I am officially uploading things very slowly. And I'm sure the algorithm is screaming and throwing a fit and very upset with me. Um, but we are doing it. We are doing it. Um, so far, what I'm doing is making sort of short discussions uh, that are kind of lead-ins to these fuller episodes of the podcast as a sort of promotional sense. Because uh, on Instagram, you can post a photo. Twitter, you can post the links. TikTok, you can't really do promotion. Wink, wink. Um, it's kind of like Reddit. You can't promote yourself, really. So uh, I, uh, I'm getting around that by doing sort of short snippets of what episodes will be uh, for people to pique their interest and check out the full feed if they so wish. Uh, so aside from that, guys, that's really it. Uh, I hope you guys had a great time. I hope 2022 is going well for you so far. Knock on wood. I hope it's going great. Um, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the week and to see you guys next week. But in the meantime, remember to stay spooky. Thank you.